the talk today is going to be profiling Tamiko Nimura and Mira Shimabukuro um, as they discuss their work um, in terms of creative writing, creative nonfiction, um, drawing on their own histories, uh, on rewriting Nikkei women's resistance during World War II. Tamiko Nimura is a, an Asian American creative nonfiction writer and public historian who lives in um, Tacoma, Washington, and I'm new to the region, so I'm really looking forward to reading from and uh, learning about the history in um, in the Northwest around uh, incarceration of Japanese Americans. And Mira Shimabukuro is a uh, one of our shining lights in the IAS faculty. She teaches; she's a teaching professor, and um, she teaches on the politics of language and literacy. Something I learned about Mira is she's also a creative writer, and I believe she holds an MFA. And so, really looking forward to um, engaging more with that work as well. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to both Tamiko and Mira, and um, they have a presentation, and I think they're going to have a facilitated conversation as well. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you and welcome. We're so happy that all of you are here. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so um, I'm Dr. Shimabukuro and Dr. Nimura and I are going to talk about um, our collaboration, which was made possible by the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle. But to talk about the collaboration, we really need to engage in a bit of conversation about our books and, and what led them here and here they are. Uh, up on the screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Tamiko. Thank you for having me. Um, we also wanted to talk a bit about, uh, we want to unpack our title, basically. So what it means to actually remember something, what it means to remember resistance, and then specifically what it is to talk about Nikkei women's resistance during World War II. These are all uh, kind of layered questions that we wanted to um, discuss before we got to the actual collaboration. So, of course, we don't have time to do a whole history of Japanese American incarceration. Over a thousand books have been published uh, on the subject, at least according to the Library of Congress. And yet we know it's still an event in history that is somewhat unknown uh, or misunderstood. So for our talk, it's just really important to know sort of these, these two big things, right? In 1942, the US government forces over 120,000 uh, US residents of Japanese ancestry into incarceration camps uh, during World War II. And incarcerated Nikkei, which is a, is a larger umbrella term for anyone of Japanese ancestry, are often sort of discussed or written as, quote, quiet Americans um, who did not protest their so-called relocation. And you can kind of see that the, the concept of quiet Americans is, is becomes really um, a kind of proto or precursor to the model minority um, stereotype. Um, we do want to make this point because it always comes up uh, that this period is, is often referred to as internment, but this is actually a sleight of hand euphemism and it's really important to correct. Um, legally, the term internment refers to the legal, uh, in uh, times of war, the legal imprisonment of residents who were born in countries designated as quote, enemy um, during that time. But two thirds of all people imprisoned uh, who were of Japanese ancestry were actually citizens of the United <coughs> States. And so when the word internment is used, it sort of, it, it, it sort of covers up uh, that fact in, um, in a, a really kind of dangerous uh, way that we want to point out. And I actually just um, read today or yesterday that the APA style guide has just taken out <laughs> the word internment and in, in place of incarceration. So that's great, great news. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw that and I thought, oh, we have to talk about that. It's so exciting. <laughs> it's probably another several decades for yeah. that cycle, but still, yeah. it's a start. Um, so, yes. Um, we hereby refuse the graphic novel that I co-authored with uh, documentarian and journalist Frank Abe um, was really commissioned by the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. And for those of you in the Seattle area who um, might not have been to the Wing, 
truly it's a special place it's i still believe it's one of the only if not the only pan asian american uh, pacific islander museums um, in the country um, and it's pioneered a bunch of wonderful um beautiful models about uh, about collaboration and about community um if we can just maybe uh, go to the next slide to show people what it looks like mm -hmm. There we are. Yes. Um, so it's the Chinatown International District. They converted a historic uh, building into what is now the museum, and it's a really wonderful place. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the community collaboration model that the wing employs for all of its exhibits, um, which will be the next slide. There's a really elaborate flow chart. Um, there are participating community members, there's always staff members, um, and then a community advisory committee, um, which helps us, to, uh, which helps the wing then to direct content to make sure that it's really reaching and networking and engaging with the community that or communities that uh, they want to partner with um, to, in order to mount an exhibit. Um, I believe it was pioneered by Ron Chu, who was two executive directors ago, um, and that model then has been taken up by other museums around the country. So it's a really amazing thing. Um, pioneer was perhaps the wrong word, but um, certainly groundbreaking in terms of how museums engage with constituents in order to portray histories. So, yeah, in fact, I think the very first time they used this model was actually on their first very big exhibit about Executive Order 9066, right. which led the way to uh, Japanese American incarceration. Um, but it was this, uh, we call them CACs for short, um, it was this CAC that this is how Tamiko and I met. I was actually asked to um, become a member of the CAC for the graphic novel process even, um, and it was before uh, we had chosen the uh, authors and illustrators who had submitted proposals um, and such. And so this is how Tamiko and I came together to work on this project. Okay, so a little bit um, about me and my background and sort of how I came to do this work. Um, so. I noted, as noted earlier, I'm a teaching professor here in IAS. I'm a poet and I'm a writing studies scholar. Um, I do, I teach the class types of classes that Brenda talked about. I also teach a class on Japanese American incarceration. My book, Relocating Authority, focuses on the uses of writing in the incarceration camp. Um, I think it's important though for me to state very upfrontly, right, that that my biological family was not incarcerated during World War II. So I'm mixed Uchinanchu, which are the indigenous people of Okinawa, Japan, but I was born and raised in Portland and my grandfather and great grandparents came to the United States as plantation workers via Hawaii. And the greater Japanese diaspora in Hawaii was not incarcerated because it was so large, it would have crashed the entire economy if people had been rounded up in camps. This is one of the reasons we know it was a lie when it was said that people were rounded up for national security. If that had really been the case, then you know everyone in uh, Hawaii, which of course is closer to Japan, would have also been rounded up. Um, that's not to say people were not uh, held from Hawaii, they were, but it wasn't the same kind of mass incarceration that we saw on the West Coast. So my Issei or immigrant grandfather was detained right after Pearl Harbor for a week by the FBI, separated from his family. But um, he, was, he was allowed to go home after a week. We are not completely sure why or what transpired, but he was a leftist, he was an Okinawan labor organizer, and he was quite vocal all the time about his opposition to Japanese imperialism. So my family thinks they let him go because it was clear he could not stand the Japanese uh, emperor. My stepmother's family was held in Minidoka, Idaho, a camp we are going to discuss later today. And it's the camp where people um, in this area, most of people in this area were sent. But I did not grow up with her. We met when I was a teenager. My parents split up when I was young and had split custody for many years. And this meant that I was raised in part 
by a single father who, despite coming from Hawaii, became a pretty prominent community activist for Japanese American redress and reparations during the 1970s and 80s. He was also a community journalist. Some of you know that he was the editor of the International Examiner here in the ID for a long time. And he was also a community historian. And there you can see the two of us in, in Portland uh, in the late um, 1970s and um, his book about the Japanese American redress movement here in Seattle. And because he was a single parent, I was brought along to planning meetings, fundraisers, events, as well as the newspaper offices of several community newspapers during the Japanese American reparations and redress movement. For example, when I was six years old, my father helped organize Portland's first day of remembrance, which was there. It has now become a kind of annual day where uh, the Nikkei communities um, up and down the West Coast uh, remember the um, signing of uh, Executive Order 9066, which put the incarceration um, uh, uh, process into motion. I'm sitting somewhere in that in the crowd of that black and white photograph. I don't know where, of course, but I'm some, somewhere in that crowd at probably about age seven. As such, so community activism and memories of incarceration uh, surrounded me as a child. Okay, and so this in this way, redress or the importance of setting right what was wrong was a constant theme uh, throughout my childhood, both in terms of the general concept and the actual movement for reparations. But something did trouble me as I grew up in this environment. There was a pretty pervasive idea floating about that had several components. And here's how I characterize it in my book. That while camp was clearly bad, very few incarcerees engaged in conscious struggle. That those who did were numerically insignificant. There weren't that many of them. That Nikkei incarcerees were generally pretty quiet or even silent. And that this silence meant that they were passive. And that really it took the Sansei or the third generation to uh, sort of start things rolling, to, to spur up the, the old folks to, to redress all that they had endured. So that was, a, that was a pretty common sort of narrative understanding, right? And so even as it bothered me, I did often presume it to be true. I believed, as I think a lot of folks did, that very few incarceries complained or protested against their conditions. And the few that did, the Min Yasui's, the Gordon Hirabayashi's, the Fred Korematsu's, the Harry Ueno's, or the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee, that they were all men. Okay. So to get specific about my academic training as a writing teacher and literacy theorist, I am very interested in how people use writing in the face of injustice. So sometimes this means examining actual texts and documents that people wrote. And sometimes this means investigating the stories of the activity of writing. Okay, so that's in some ways, that's one of the things that um, divides like literacy studies people from literary studies people. We tend to get very interested in the, the activity of writing sort of the the sociological conditions, so to speak. So what, in, what went into it and why? And while my book focuses on sort of reconceptualizing how we understand Nikkei resistance in response to incarceration by studying writing generally, this exploration really allowed me to see something about women's resistance. And to understand Nikkei's women's participation in resistance during camp, we have to challenge the dismissive concept of a supporting role. Right? And we have to do so on two fronts. We have to think about what counts as activism and what stories have been silenced or unaccounted for across history. Okay, so those two things. So one of the more famous protest resistance movements in camp was the Heart Mountain Draft Resistance. So in January 1944, two years after Pearl Harbor and the classification of young American male citizens of Japanese ancestry as aliens not acceptable to the armed forces, 
or any group of persons not acceptable. The War Department announced that the Japanese American men were now reclassified back and made susceptible to the military draft. So they could be drafted now out of camp. And the hypocrisy was astonishing given that everybody was still in camp after being forcibly removed uh, from their homes in spring 1942. As our great historian Mitchie Waglin put it, the right of draft eligibility returned only one right of citizenship, the right to be shot at. So in Hard Mountain, Wyoming, which where one of the other main camps were, was a movement to resist the draft was organized by a group called the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee, whose manifesto is pictured there above. And if you're interested in learning more about this movement, we highly recommend um, the documentary Conscience and the Constitution, which was uh, made by uh, Tomiko's uh, co-author, Frank Ave, and I believe it's available to stream through the UW libraries for free. This manifesto declares that the men will not fight unless all of their citizenship rights are restored. It is the key document that caused them to be thrown into federal prison away from the camps. And women contribute heavily to this document and many other Fair Play Committee activities, often making use of skills that we typically associate with quote unquote women's work. One of the Fair Play Committee leaders, Frank Emmy, told me, for example, that his sister could type much faster than he could. This was not uncommon, as many 20-something Nisei women had developed strong organizational typing and stenography skills prior to the wars in hopes that they might join the burgeoning secretarial pools for, for work. So Kaoru Emmy typed many draft resistance documents. She also went to meetings being held by the Japanese American Citizens League, which at the time was colluding with the government, and took notes for Frank and the other Fair Play Committee leaders, since Fair Play Committee members could easily be recognized and called out by the JACL. Her notes enabled the committee to better anticipate what JACL leaders were saying about them, which in turn helped them construct stronger arguments and better organize among incarcerates. So in this way, Kaudu Emi, who's pictured there, participated in the largest draft resistance movement that we know of. But women didn't just enable resistance from sort of behind the stage, right? There are numerous, numerous examples of women writing as women, often inhabiting the subject position of mothers in order to protest the living conditions of camp. Lack of winter clothing, lack of running or hot water, lack of nutritious food. Women also wrote to protest policy, like the government's announcement of the draft. So letters from groups of mothers emerged in multiple camps. These groups were uh, uh, made up of predominantly Issei or immigrant women writing to authorities to protest some aspect of the drafting of their sons. And the mothers at both the Poston camp and Minidoka wrote and sent their letters before the Heart Mountain Draft Sisters even took their public stand. So I first learned about this particular letter through Karen Ishizuka's book, Lost and Found, which is about the development of the first exhibit on incarceration at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. But it's really the story behind the letter that makes it so powerful in my mind. A story I learned by drawing upon multiple community networks I was embedded in. This letter was actually the second version of a letter the women hoped to send. Now, I know this is really tiny and I, I don't expect you to read it. I just wanted to put the sort of image of this other letter up here. So the first version was drafted for them by Min Yasui. And so let me sort of set the stage for this story. As I noted, the, the return of the draft eligibility returned only one right of citizenship. That was the right to be shot at, as Michi Whiteland put it. And yet many Nisei men met the call. In the telling of this time period, even within the community, Nisei men rose to the occasion to valiantly and tragically, quote, prove their loyalty by responding to the call to enlist in segregated units. I can't fully debate the extent to which these young men resisted or enlisted or how enthusiastically or defeatedly the young men shipped out. 
but it took many, many years to confirm even that there even were resistors at all across all the camps, and even more to restore some sense of honor to their name and actions. In Minidoka, Idaho, which is where the majority of the people from the Pacific Northwest were sent, 38 individual male resistors eventually emerged, but draft age citizen men, or the Nisei, never successfully organized as a cohesive movement. A few attempts had been made but those fizzled out as eligible men tended to, to, they disagreed about the particulars of, of the kind of stand that they were going to take. Meanwhile, there were a few mothers who had heard about uh, the kind of fizzled out organizing indirectly, but others were, had been actively arguing with their sons that they should be putting up some kind of protest. When nothing seemed to transpire within a couple of weeks of the draft's announcement, several women decided to consult a lawyer to compose their own petition. This lawyer seems to have been the infamous Min Yasui. Yasui was a Nisei lawyer from Portland, Oregon. He was well known and respected among many incarcerated Nikkei, both for his early refusal to abide by the first round of discriminatory curfew laws handed down after Pearl Harbor, and he, his legal challenge to end those laws. He eventually lost his case and spent nine months in solitary confinement, but afterwards he was released to Minidoka and he had basically become a folk hero among many in the community for the stand that he had taken. So given this history, yes, he seemed like the perfect person to organize a public stance against the draft. But despite his early commitment to civil disobedience, he actually publicly opposed all resistance to the draft. Instead, Min Yasui believed it would be important to serve in order to demonstrate loyalty. So he did compose this draft for them and when it, uh, for the Mother Society of Minidoka, and when it was circulated, many of the women were unhappy with this draft. A lot of women didn't believe it would be very effective, especially if they didn't definitively say, we're not allowing our sons uh, to go unless they get equal rights. Others, however, had really strong feelings about the tone, the complaining quite a bit about the wording in Min Yasui's version, saying that it was too weak. So they rewrote the letter. Okay. Led by Fuyo Tanagi, a former newspaper editor, and a few other Issei women. And this, this quote is actually, uh, is, uh, our, is Tanagi's words, right? If Nisei are drafted now, it's Inujini. They really have nothing to fight for. All their lives, the Iseis have worked for their children, putting a great deal of hope in them. They lost their business and everything except their children. Now they seem to take them away too. Okay, and so here's their their whole letter, and I, I actually have this I write I have a whole chapter about this uh, letter in my book, which is also available at UW Library, so no one has to go and buy it if you don't want to, but you can uh, read a little bit more about it. The letter was sent to several officials, including the director of the Minidoka um, camp, the head of the entire war relocation authority, which oversaw all the camps. It was also sent to the president, and it was sent to the first lady. Okay. And over a hundred women signed it. Okay. And so here's a copy of all of their signatures. There are a number of other examples I discuss in my book, but putting this, uh, piecing this story together helped clarify for me um, the ways in which women uh, participate in resistance during incarceration. And I was happy to share what I had learned in various community sites, including sort of the annual pilgrimages uh, to Minidoka, Idaho, to the ja at, at the talks at the Japanese American National Museum, and certainly on Wing Luke's community advisory committees. And where, um, and uh, just to really show that women were sort of actively redressing the harm that incarceration had caused and that these stories um, really need to be known about. Um, and, and as I've shared them, they've been very much uh, embraced. I'm gonna turn it over to Tomiko. 
Okay, um, so um, Mira has given you then uh, the whole backstory behind uh, part, uh, well, not the whole story, but a lot of the backstory then behind um, one the one storyline that we decided to take up in the graphic novel that I co-authored, We Hereby Refuse. Before I get to that book, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about my own family history um, here and how that played into the graphic novel writing and really my whole participation in the project. Um, on the left here, we have Hiroshi Kashiwaki, who is one of three main uh, figures that we follow in We Hereby Refuse. Um, I am actually half Filipina, half Japanese American. Um, my uncle on the left here married one of my dad's sisters. Um, and Kashiwaki was known for his resistance to government loyalty questionnaires during camp. Um, and then on the right, um, my Nisei dad, Taku, is actually standing at the center of the picture here. Um, the picture was taken sometime after the war. Um, and I am, um, I'm, I'm always, um, I always get a little choked up when I see this picture because with the exception of the toddler in arms, everyone in this picture from my family was incarcerated during World War II um, at Tule Lake. And I grew up knowing about this history and that history continues to resonate um, for all the people in this picture um, to today and to me and my, my sister's generation. Uh, my grandfather Junichi actually, who is uh, the second seated in the front from the left and the older man, um, he was the uh, first Issei, first, uh, that is gen first generation Japanese immigrant to be arrested from within Tule Lake for actually speaking out against the draft and trying to convince the young Issei that they did not owe uh, the country this form of loyalty. So when I applied to be a writer for this book, I knew that I wanted to be involved with such an important project about resistance. Um, why a graphic novel? A lot of people will talk, uh, will ask us about the graphic novel format. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, the Wing Luke, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, had applied for a grant from the National Park Service for a series of graphic novels. And they wanted to do graphic novels because they knew that it would help their mission. And the mission I have quoted here, we connect everyone to the dynamic history, cultures, and art of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders through vivid storytelling and inspiring experiences to advance racial and social equity. And that, uh, that vivid storytelling piece, right, is key. Um, and the first graphic novel in the series um, is about Nisei soldiers. The second one, which is um, We Hereby Refuse, and, and uh, is about resistance. And then the third one will be uh, out later this year, I believe, and it's about those who helped Japanese Americans during the incarceration period. Um, there is a creative team, certainly, uh, behind the book, which we'll see in the, the next slide. Um, so myself, as one of the authors, Matt Sasaki, who illustrated my uncle Hiroshi's storyline, Frank Abe, who we've mentioned earlier, um, well-known documentarian, journalist, historian, and then Ross Ishikawa, um, another illustrator. All of us are um, from the Japanese American community. All of us have relatives, um, quite directly relatives who were incarcerated. And so this makes our book uh, different from a lot of the other books which are out there um, popularly known um, to have a, a book authored from within the community, um, the whole team. Um, George Takei's book is not, for example. So I'm going to show you just a bit of the process behind the graphic novel and how we used uh, Mira's wonderful and rich research and conducted some of our own. So here's the next slide. You can see um, a facsimile, basically, of the petition um, and the letters that we wrote that that the mothers wrote. Um, quite a direct facsimile, or as close as we could to put it into the graphic novel. Um, the next uh, slide, after um, sort of just reading briefly about uh, the Mother's Society in Mira's book, I was really excited. Uh, Mira connected me with Sharon Tanagi Aburano, who uh, lives over in Bellevue, 
and I went to go visit her and talk to her. Um, there was a photograph of the, the classroom where a lot of Issei mothers took English um, just partly to have something to do and to have some um, an activity to go to. Um, and Sharon had just the most fantastic collection of stories and scrapbooks. You can actually see a bunch of them on the table in front of her in the picture on the right that she brought out for me from the cabinet just to show me um, all the different pictures she had of her story. Um, I also spoke, um, we also spoke with uh, um, Faye, with Fuyo Tanagi's son, Shig, and his daughter-in-law. So in the next slide, I spoke with Faye Tanagi, who um, actually wrote a research paper about her mother-in-law um, back in the 1980s. And she uh, talked about just sort of, you know, um, Mrs. Tanagi's journey. Um, she was actually quite well-educated and rare for um, a, a woman of her uh, age to be educated so well in Japan. Um, and then I um, and so and we all and then um, Frank actually talked to Shig um, Fuyo Tanagi's son. So we had this family archival research thread going as well. Um, and then from there, in the next slide, uh, we started to write story arcs for some of the larger threads that we knew we were going to pursue. We had to write character sketches because the artists didn't necessarily know very much about these three characters, um, what are they like, what are they like when they get angry, um, what are they like when they <laughs> are sort of just every day um, going about their lives. So I wrote a story arc here uh, based on that research that I conducted along with Mira's research. Um, trying to figure out how to put that into um, a longer description. Uh, from there, in the next slide, um, a lot, and both of us really, Frank and I both worked on a lot of these pieces, um, but I believe it is, this is Frank's work here. Um, Frank made what's called an impaneled script, meaning that we had to take the story arcs and put them into panels approximately with a written script. Um, what does the dialogue look like? What does the what are the actions that are happening? What's the setting? Um, what are the stage directions? Um, what kinds of faces might they be making, for example, or, or what kind of tone um, of voices? So that impaneled script then um, went through many iterations and the um, we had to find reference photos also for the artists um, to find, again, what would these people look like? What do the settings look like? Um, what cars might they have driven, for example, all of those things. And from there, the artists went to work. And you can see in the next slide here, uh, this is Rossi Shikawa's work. Um, they drew us some thumbnail sketches based on script just to see what they might look like um, based on the script we had given them. Um, and that went through a few iterations. And then we went to the, um, the next two final pages um, that would involved inking and coloring, um, dialogue, what kinds of fonts, um, how are we going to uh, translate um, that the dialogue would have been in Japanese. And we chose to use italics for that reason here. Um, there were lots of decisions and lots of back and forth that went into this discussion. Um, I also love that we had given uh, Ross here, this artist, um, a headshot with Mrs. Tanagi and she was wearing pearls. And in an earlier version of this um, script or an earlier version of these drawings, we saw her and she had the pearls on still. And Frank was very quick to jump on that saying, nobody would wear pearls in camp, That ha those have to go. Um, so all those kinds of historical details and, uh, and accuracies were really um, important to uh, the making of the book. So that's basically how we put that research into play. Um, but for every single scene in the book, every single page, every line of dialogue is drawn somewhere from uh, the historical record. And we're pretty proud of that fact. Um, the other thing that when we showed, when Frank showed the, um, the final pages or so to Mira, she was very clear that this was not just Mrs. Tanagi, that this was a collective action. Um, this was the action of, you know, maybe not just one, but several leaders. We don't know exactly who the leaders were, but there were several leaders behind this movement. And so I think it's quite fitting then that all of that went into the writing of the graphic novel, that, that impulse to be collective and collaborative. Um, it truly took 
a whole village <laughs> uh, to write this, gra this graphic novel. Besides the creative team, the winglet staff, the community advisory committee, and all the people we talked to in order to make the book happen. Um, there was a collective activism and a collective remembering that was happening as we were creating the book. So in the next slide, um, let's see. So, yeah, I think this is the, the layered um, slide. Oh. Yeah, okay. so, um, so, <laughs> so we just really wanted to emphasize sort of the collectivity of the activism, both that's represented in the book, but also in the kind of activity of remembering this time period and the, the resistance and, um, and actually what happened. And that, you know, this really, um, you know, there's this individual project, but this is also sort of part of, um, of, of work that really dates back to at least the 1970s. I think, you know, I think if, if not, if not before, including things like the Day of Remembrance, some for me, some my dad's work, um, I think, you know, Karen Ishizuka's work in Lost and Found, um, the Japanese American National Museum and the, and the archives that are held there at the Hirosaki National Resource Center. Certainly Densho has, has played a very large uh, role. Densho is based in Seattle, but it is a um, kind of completely online digital uh, archive that has, has grown sort of exponentially um, across the years. Um, of course, the Wing Luke, but then there's also other um, other sort of ongoing uh, community uh, projects like the pilgrimages. This is one for the Minidoka pilgrimage. Um, there's uh, Nancy Kai's uh, work with uh, 50 uh, objects and stories, and then um, Suda for Solidarity, which is sort of continued sort of rem remembering work and sort of bridging um, sort of the memory of incarceration to um, uh, sort of uh, atrocities of, of today. And, you know, as I, as I, uh, Tomiko and I were talking and I was thinking a lot about some of the um, scholarship that has been done uh, in community literacies and cultural rhetorics. And I wanted to think about the ways in which we think of of even community partners and how we might think of it as community reciprocity. So um, the indigenous scholar Ellen Cushman has, has talked about sort of these networks of reciprocity. Therese Momberg has really talked a lot about um, sort of thinking about community engagement across a longer arc of time and how it is just, it has a kind of ongoing uh, relationship. It doesn't just happen with one project, right? Certainly the project, you know, the book project itself I mean, it's still being promoted and things, and you could say it's over, but really I think the work of it is, is still um, continues. And I think it's why uh, a lot of the work that both Tomiko and I do are in uh, community spaces, um, either in person or online. Um, oops. And so we just wanted to sort of close by sort of highlighting some other work that we think is really worth um, looking out for or checking out. Um, there's uh, the Japanese American Women's Speaks group, uh, which is based in Los Angeles. Um, certainly Densho, Densho has an ongoing blog. Um, they've, they've done some writing about that, that draft resistance movement and the role of Issei um, women. Um, Tamiko, do you wanna say a few things about these some of the books that we have up here. Sure. So uh, the scholar uh, Diane Fujino has done work on Mitsuya Yamada and her wonderful poetry and work of resistance. Um, Karen Tayamashita's book Letters to Memory is this really wonderful, um, quite literary dialogue with uh, her her own family archives around the incarceration. Um, and then Kiku Hughes's novel, a graphic novel, Displacement, which is really a queer time traveling feminist project, um, really taking, I think, incarceration history into um, directions where it 
you know, could be heading for a while. And it's been very exciting to me to see these kinds of books um, taking up the project of, of remembering, but also really trying to push us into, you know, yes, we remember this, but what have we still not remembered? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So that's all we've prepared for today. Uh, and thank you very much. We happily answer any questions we can. Yes, please do. I love questions. It's so great to talk to people, even in the virtual environment. So thank you so much for this very powerful and very moving presentation. Uh, I have a question for you, Mira. Uh, I was once again very moved to hear about your father um, introducing you to political activism at a very young age. You also mentioned that um, uh, that your you your father was a single a single parent and i wonder i mean i'm i'm sure that and i'm imagining this that part of him taking you to these political activism circles was because he probably didn't find a place to leave you but <laughs> i i'm also curious to know whether he was very intentional in politicizing your question uh, sorry your consciousness mm. about your past uh, uh, and the lived reality of his own life and and what and whether he wanted to leave a legacy in you to carry his work forward. Yes. Um, okay, I'm going to try and answer this question. Um, I lost my father last year, and so this is still a pretty um, fresh emotional thing for me. Um, so my um, so to to clarify my parents had split custody. So in some ways I had sort of two single parents and um, thank you, Alka. Um, um, but yes, I, you know, both of my parents were, uh, were, were activists. They were community activists. They, they were people um, uh, very much of their time period of the, of the late sixties and early seventies. Um, definitely were both are, were are both radicals um and really did not think that really believed sort of children were part of all sort of social and political organizing not in a sort of doctrinaire or dogmatic way but that if you were involved in social and political life that that your children were part of that and so in with both of my parents in the work that they were doing, I was I was brought to things all the time. Um, I, it is true we did there wasn't any place else to leave me, but I think I think it was really of their ethos to just have me come along, generally, if that makes sense. I can't speak to how conscious they were of the. Okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna imbue Mira with this particular political consciousness, but it it was happening. It was it was happening, and I actually I actually write a little bit about this in my book too. That it was um, um, that that it was uh, very much the sort of beginning of sort of my this kind of embodied sense sensibility about what should happen in the world. I hope that answers your question, Elka. Yes, it does. Thank you okay. so much. And I just wanted to congratulate you for having had the good fortune of having been raised by such uh, conscientious parents who were awake to their past and awake to your future. Thank you. I'm curious, this is a, maybe for both of you, maybe Tamiko first and then Mira. So you talked about why you chose graphic, the graphic novel and you talked about producing it, but I'm curious now that it's out in the world, if you could just talk more about how you see a graphic novel, like entering spaces, and I'm wondering about kids and school and how it's being picked up. So I'd love to hear more about that. And then maybe for you, Mira, seeing your work translated into these other genres, I'm curious what new insights you've had about how to think about your own work. Um, sure, thank you for those questions. I am, it's so funny that people are now, you know, you know, talk about me as a graphic novelist. I certainly, I certainly read a bunch before. I had taught a few, but uh, I had not written one before this, and I still feel, in some ways, quite inexperienced because 
I, at heart, I'm a words girl. <laughs> um, I'm not necessarily an image person. And so um, to think in, in this way was really quite a stretch in some ways for me. Um, but I will say that I really love where the graphic novel gets to take us, right? Um, and I learned a bit about just sort of how they work on us through uh, Scott McLeod's work um, in his series of books, which starts with understanding comics. Um, you know, what is that space between panels that makes us right join the actions between the two things together? Um, I love um, hearing from my uh, seventh grade your uh, seventh grade uh, daughter's classmate who texted me and said, "Hi, I really loved your book. <laughs> um, I love how." People will take up a graphic novel when they will not take up a sort of straight history textbook, mm -hmm. right? And that um, in some ways it's much more accessible, right? It, um, you know, and like books that, you know, unlike say films, right? Books are portable, books can kind of take, you know, you can take them with you to wherever um, still. And I have loved that piece about it, that it's been a format that a lot more, that I think would have, that's gained a greater audience for the incarceration story. Um, so that's been really lovely to see. Um, in answer to your question to me, Ben, I, you know, this this is by far like this is this is the highlight for me right is that is that I so I used to say that when I present in community spaces especially when I presented it at the pilgrimages which is you know mostly all survivors and their families who attend those that that I am completing the final parts of my dissertation defense right like that that is where it matters that is where it matters but having my work appear and, and my to be clear this the mothers of Minidoka is um it's like it's actually one of the minor stories it's not one of the main stories in the thing but even that like even three pages right like it's the most incredible honor to me you know i feel like okay good i'm done you know i mean not really i'm done but you know i i i feel like that is has just really um it's it's the best and i particularly am happy about it because the the graphic novel was was um created entirely by uh descendants of of survivors and actually that's probably the most important to me because like i said my own family people typically assume that my family was incarcerated but i really see myself um I can only think of this of a sports metaphor here, but I really see the work that I did as more like a point guard. Like I'm just like, let me let me give this to folks who can, you know, I, I had the time to do this research. Let me give it to folks who can run with it. And where I think um, it, it really matters, not just in communicating it outward, but also, you know, there's there's important sort of memory healing work that happens right when we get to sort of work with these stories um and you know this is an event that happened quite some time ago at this point and communities are still in the process of healing from it this kind of follows that question i think i'm curious mm -hmm. about sort of the the problems of archives not necessarily in what you found while you were researching but where your book is ending up now even thinking about things like um the term internment being updated to incarceration um uh, you were pulling from a lot of different sources and doing this research and and now this book is going in a lot of different places and i'm wondering how you feel about like where its place is in perhaps archives that are that are more connected to the communities that you were that you were embedded in and then also being on the shelf in the library next to books with outdated language and like where do you think your the role of this book is in either shifting that or becoming enmeshed in that 
Hmm, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, I do feel like, you know, I mean, when we say that the term just got updated through the AP style guide, right? This is a conversation that's been happening within the Japanese American community for a couple of decades, as far as I know. Um, that, and, and I think I even was still using internment maybe 10 years ago. And so that, you know, that shift, right, has been decades in the making. So I feel pretty comfortable that, you know, we use incarceration in the title, not internment. We had debates over that, um, that we tried to work with the best of what we knew, you know, from existing, right, archives. Um, in Mira's book, she talks about the problems of uh, some of the um, some of the reports that people have used. Um, there's a book called the, the, the Spoilage, which is the whole compilation of sociologists' work, right, sort of within the camp and outside of the camp um, that have problems, <laughs> right. Um, so I feel like we're still in pretty good conversation that we're certainly pushing things forward. Um, or rather just kind of continuing the conversation of you know connecting the incarceration to histories of today with the final pages of the graphic novel um i feel like it stands up to um a lot of what we what we know about archives and the history um i feel pretty good about that piece of it um and certainly there's a lot more to do there's a lot more there are many more stories to tell um a lot more healing to do but I feel like it's we produce it with sort of what I would all sort of call state of the art <laughs> knowledge <laughs> right, about um, the incarceration histories. Um, hi, Mira. Hi, Tamiko. Thank you so much for that uh, our presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, something I think that, that those of us who, who are interested in this history uh, have been learning, or at least I have been learning and I'm still grappling with uh, from your work. Um, is how much our ideas about uh, resistance are uh, themselves gendered, right? Heavily gendered. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in addition to thinking about, you know, the, um, the, the histories of women's resistance that have not been told, right? Sort of thinking about how uh, we've been, you know, maybe looking in the wrong place or had ideas about resistance that, that we need to rethink. And so I was wondering if you had more to say about how, um, how the, the research that you've done has um, uh, made you rethink, but what counts as resistance and how it's been how it's been general. Mary, do you want to go first? Um, sure, sure. Well, I you know, I, I touched on it a little bit when I was talking about the story of um, Kaoru Emi, and I you know one of the things that was really helpful for me is because I was. I, I mean, I was I was looking at resistance, but that was I, it was almost like I was not look, trying to look for it head on. I was I was trying to understand writing, right? Like I was trying to understand, and I was trying to understand writing that responded to um, the experience of camp. And um, in doing so, that sort of allowed me to attend to things in different kinds of ways. Like there was a there was a lot of stuff that I ended up talking about that I don't think was ever published, for example. It wasn't public writing, right? Like I've, you know, I have a whole chapter on private writing. That's one example. But the other thing is I got really interested as writing teachers do at, at looking at drafts of things that were in archives. So especially at the Japanese American National Museum, I, I was like looking at drafts and drafts of things that you know, where people were trying to figure out what to say and how to say it, right? And for a writing teacher, that's like, oh my God, that's great. You know, they should have just wrote, did a portfolio and reflected on this writing. That would have helped me so much. Um, but that allowed me to, you know, I, I know this can sound kind of corny, but it is really how I felt it. I felt like it allowed me to sort of experience the activity, right? Like the ways in which the activity itself was this kind of activism, like that there were probably arguments going on about how to put something, right? Or how to say something. Things that I, you know, feel very uh, present with, you know, in, in my day-to-day -day life as well. Um, but also, I mean, there's there's a lot of theorizing, right, that's come out in, in, in community literacies and cultural rhetorics that helps us kind of see, the, helps us understand um, <clears throat> Therese Momberg, who's who has uh, written about the rhetorical work of the 
Filipino American National Historical uh, Society, right, has written about Dorothy Cordova's work, has, has really talked about how we see uh, sort of rhetorical activist work, quote, behind the podium as actually being central to what takes place at the podium, right? And so that, that was really helpful for me. And, you know, as someone who does a has done a lot of quote behind the scenes work in in many arenas of my life that felt very um real to me right and especially having grown up among activists and so like seeing them around folding tables with like messy potlucks immersed with uh, uh mailings and like you know, paper cuts from folding envelope, you know, like it's all just, um, it's all activism. A lot of activism is like not glamorous at all, right? A lot of it is just a lot of, just a lot of hard work. So I don't know, that's sort of how I've kind of thinking of it now. I don't know, tell me what you see, yeah. As for me, I really thought I saw, um, I, I think I might've seen resistance and, um, and courage even as, sort of uh, one dimensionally, right? As a sort of upfront bravado right away, fearless, I'm gonna do this. It'll, you know, no, you know, no dithering behind the scenes and all of that. And really learning a lot more about uh, Mitya Endo's story, which is what we, uh, one of the main storylines we cover in the book. Um, we're learning about her and just how scared she was, how reluctant she was. Um, but still made the decisions that she did and then retreated back into the background after camp and after her case. Um, I still really loved that, you know, despite all of those fears, she made the decisions that she did and not without consequence. And so for me, that really helped broaden my definition of resistance. Such a powerful, powerful presentation. And I don't, almost don't want it to end, although I know people have places to go. I, I would love to ask one question. I thought one of the things that was the promise of, of this medium, I mean, that was also like, I'm curious as to like the embodied experience of, of the, the, I think you call them the, empan, the empanels, um, envisioning that like, so what really struck me in one of that is just like the very small shifts in facial expression from one panel to the other. And, you know, that was very subtle and really powerful uh, in conveying something that the bubble dialogue, you know, it goes with that. And could you say something, I mean, in terms of what that platform might allow that, even if you're a word girl, there's something connecting that, which is also just really different from film or, you know, um, and yeah. the graphic novel as a medium, but I, I'm just like really thinking about it because my kids are super into graphic novels. And that's- intimacy, I would like to say, I'm sorry to interrupt you if you weren't done. Um, but I do think that there's a particular intimacy, right? That readers enter into with, with words, but also with graphic novels, right? There's sort of enough, but not enough, right? So that you do have to do as a reader, some kind of work, right, to make, you know, a jump between these different panels, different pages, for us, several different storylines, um, color palettes, and so on, that there is an engagement, I think, that happens on a couple of levels, right, with the dialogue and the images, and so on, and the setting, that, um, that other media might not. So I was really grateful to be a part of learning about that. All right, folks, we are at time. Um, I would like to plug these books for your, um, ed, you know, to edify all of us. They are available at the library and other outlets as well. And <laughs> so I think that we can say that. But thank you so much, um, Tamiko and Mira. Um, I think we'll be making the presentation available. And uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, I think we can share share your contact information. And uh, I. Very grateful. Thank you so much.